a long, long time ago, uh, a, a sort of prop was introduced to the show and has somehow survived to this very day uh, as a major plot device. And so we're going to go on a brief history of the sonic screwdriver. And by a brief history, I mean uh, as brief as, you know, 60 years of this thing could be made. So um, starting off, we're going to 1968, which is The Fury from the Deep. Now, this episode is sadly lost. The BBC decided we need some space on the shelves in the archive. Let's just set fire to a few Doctor Who episodes, you know? Why not? Uh, so the original appearance is lost, unfortunately. Now, interestingly, speaking of lost things, uh, the prop seen there, which is a sort of regular sort of style of screwdriver, uh, that was dropped down a drain before they actually filmed anything. And so, uh, in, in true fashion, they had to improvise, and so they took the whistle off the life jacket that they were wearing in the story and utilised it as the sonic screwdriver in the scene, which is there you can see Patrick now holding it. And so it was just an Acme City life jacket whistle, um, but it is in fact the first sonic screwdriver. Um, so we all put respect on the name of the whistle. Uh, it is sonic, technically, it does make a sound. Um, so, moving forward, we've got the Dominators. This was the second appearance of the sonic screwdriver. Now the prop had changed. Uh, this, this episode does exist, um, although it probably couldn't. It is kind of boring. Um, but uh, <laughs> they could have burned that one. Um, but no, with, with this one, effectively, uh, the torch, the torch, uh, the prop needed to be a cutting torch. So it needed to cut through a wall in the story uh, to help out because that's what you do with screwdrivers. You cut through solid concrete. Um, and so it had this sort of handle attachment uh, that was utilized to sort of have this kind of blowtorch effect coming out of the end of it. Uh, moving on again, we move to the War Games, which is where we get the sort of more famous Second Doctor style of Sonic Screwdriver. Now this was just an ever-ready pen light, um, which was an off-the-shelf item. Later on as well, John Pert, we used a very similar one to de-hypnotize some people in the Time Warrior, um, which sort of gets confused sometimes. But effectively, uh, Patrick utilizes this just for this story to uh, actually undo a screw in a very unique fashion of actually using the screwdriver as a screwdriver. Um, so very impressive. It is my favorite part of that story because he, he tries to convince a, uh, a German uh, soldier that he is not uh, from this time period by just going, look, I can undo a screw. And it's like, that was it? That was like, you have two hearts. Like, just get a stethoscope out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but moving forward, we move on to colour. How exciting. Uh, so this is the Colony in Space. Now, Colony in Space was the first story with the Pertwee-style screwdriver, the more sort of iconic design of the sonic screwdriver, where it starts to get a kind of consistent identity. Uh, now, with this, obviously, it's brightly coloured, and it shows up for him to enter the Master's TARDIS. Uh, and it also sort of had this kind of funny thing. However, oddly, in the same story, the prop also appears uh, as a handcuff key before they've sort of done it up. However, it's not got the yellow tape on it yet or anything. It's just got uh, sort of a black spiral. So the odd thing about that is it's actually not unique to Doctor Who. This is a found item again, much like our radio buttons and Samsung things. This was actually from Thunderbirds in 1966 and Captain Scarlet. So they found, the, so in Thunderbirds 1966 effectively, because um, it was marionette puppets, um, they effectively uh, had it cut to humans occasionally for the sort of close-ups. And so with the close-ups, they would then have him pull it out of his pocket and screw it in. So this was being used as a screwdriver to fix the Zero X rocket, which was, I can't remember what happened, I think the landing brakes were broken. In, broken, in? it's not a word. Um, but effectively, uh, in Captain Scarlet, they uh, had this microphone used by Captain Blue, and that was the top of the sonic screwdriver. So they took these two props. The BBC effectively bought them from Jerry Anderson when he was having a sort of garage sale of random props that they had utilized years ago. And they stuck them together, and that became the sonic screwdriver. Moving on, we get multiple versions of John Pertwee's screwdriver. This is where we get really pedantic, where they change the top around a little bit. And that counts as a variant. Uh, and then they decided, you know what? All that electrical tape we've stuck on the handle, that's a nuisance. It keeps coming off when we're trying to film stuff. So uh, they then stripped it completely. And this is where it becomes the sort of more familiar style that was used sort of by Tom Baker. However, at this point, the difference is, and this is the only difference that makes it, you know, completely different for fans, uh, the red ring on the top there, uh, I've got a laser pointer, where is it? There it is. That is touching there, whereas later on it isn't. And that's because... Tom Baker broke it within seconds of having it. 
So Tom Baker pulls it out of his pocket in Robot and very, very uh, smoothly improvises the line. Uh, it acts as a miniature sonic lance as he reattaches the head of it um, in, in the second clip there. Uh, and when he reattached it, however, he put it a little bit too high. So it then remains for the entire time it exists sitting a little higher. Now, the other thing that makes the Tom Baker variant different is because someone stopped upkeeping the prop. So uh, all of it starts to wear down. The red ring at the top reveals that it's brass underneath, and the uh, sort of uh, white ring there that's been revealed is just the sort of chrome stuff coming off of the thumb grip where people have been moving it up and down. And then uh, it does get upkeeped in his penultimate episode. So he had it for seven years, and suddenly found someone went, maybe we should repaint this. Um, so they repainted the top a bright red, and they repainted the ring white, and that's more commonly associated with Peter Davison. Uh, so he finally got this sort of newly repainted thing. I mean, the, the head's a little bit bent there. Uh, he got this newly repainted prop and proceeded to immediately get it blown up. Um, nice one, Peter. Uh, so effectively, uh, yeah, it gets blown up in The Visitation, which is uh, one of the sort of early stories of Peter Davison. It gets switched out, of course, when it's set on fire to be a sort of plasticky kind of vac-formed prop instead. Uh, and <laughs> we don't know where either of these props are. Effectively, after it was written out, because what happened was uh, John Nathan Turner, the producer, kind of sat down and went, you guys are leaning on this prop too hard. Like, every time the Doctor needs to get out of a situation, he kind of just uses the sonic screwdriver. We should stop that. So they blew it up. And so then, a, you know, a few years go by, and Colin Baker gets a sonic lance, um, which is very exciting. It's completely different to any other prop before. It lights up red, which is really exciting. Um, and it's covered in aluminium tape because it's the 80s, and why not? Let's splash out. Um, and so, obviously, he's got this brand new prop, and he actually uses it to fix the chameleon circuit. Now, of course, you mostly will know the chameleon circuit is what makes the TARDIS change its appearance, and it's been broken for most of time. However, he got it working and then turned the TARDIS into a Hammond organ, oddly. Um, and then, of course, he looked after this prop completely and uh, kept it for his entire tenure. No, he didn't. He actually just immediately stabs it into a Cyberman's chest unit and it gets broken. And so that was the end of any sonic device in the classic era until we get to the TV movie when they decided to bring it back. And so Sylvester gets a sonic finally and then he died. So they uh, he really wasn't great going on the actual keeping things going here thing. And so then Paul gets it at the very end of the film. However, excitingly, this is the oldest surviving known Doctor's sonic screwdriver. And it is, of course, across the bridge in the St. Louis Science Center in their Doctor Who display currently. Uh, now, the interesting things about this is they've changed the mechanism. So with classic sonic screwdrivers, the way they used to work was that you would pull it down like that and it would work. However, with this one, there is, as you can see on the sort of side there, a little hole, and in there would be a button. And so you press that button and the top pops up, uh, which is why it's in collapsed mode in the Paul McGann. I'll probably point over there rather than my monitor. Uh, it's in collapsed mode with Paul McGann and open mode with uh, Sylvester there. Although, interestingly, in the movie, Sylvester's bullet is blurred out the little red bit at the top because he held it the wrong way. Um, and so the producer, who was a fan, went, oh, no, he's held it the wrong way. We'll have to... So they painstakingly sort of blurred out the top of the screwdriver to make up for this mistake. Although, interestingly, with this screwdriver, um, the prop was based on another replica, which was the 800 Trekker sonic screwdriver replica. So this was a, a fan-made replica at the time that you could buy, and they copied it dimensionally uh, and didn't utilize it um, in the show. However... One of these replicas did get utilised in the 1999 comic relief special, Curse of Fatal Death. Uh, so there is a little bit of lineage there. It was used by Joanna Lumley and had three settings. Um, and so uh, this was just a solid sort of construction uh, of just aluminium and has no interesting features other than that. Moving on, we now get to the modern era of Doctor Who. So this is the cream Aztec now. To, we're going, we're deep diving into law now. So everyone, bear with me on this one. So the cream Aztec was made by Aztec model makers in 2004. Hence why we call it the Aztec. Uh, the cream is because the handle is cream. We're very imaginative, um, and so effectively, yes, this prop started off, and so it was record. It was for recording block one 
of series one. Now, recording blocks to sort of explain the lingo of making you know TV shows and stuff. Uh, you will uh, you know sort of assort your episodes out, which you're going to film first into recording blocks. Recording block one, recording block two, and so in this case, recording block one of series one was Rose, Aliens of London, and World War Three. So they had those three episodes filmed first, which this is the only time this prop appears. So he uses it, obviously, throughout all of Rose, Aliens of London, everything like that. And then it immediately got changed for recording block two when it got turned into what we call the wide slider Aztec, though I forgot to write the word Aztec on the end. Um, so the wide slider Aztec, uh, again, imaginatively named because it's got a wide slider. Um, so we were on smoke that day when we were naming these things. Um, and so effectively, it was decided that they wanted, that, you know, Eccleston wanted this prop so that he could sort of give it a bit of action when he's doing it and slide it up and down because the way the Aztec prop works is effectively you had to manually pull the head out in and out. And you can actually see David Tennant uh, sort of getting a bit frustrated with such a mechanism and just pulling it out with his teeth, uh, which really does dent metal. Like, he should stop <laughs> biting things. Um, just so much of it has got him like a, sort of like a binky or something, like a pacifier. I'm trying to use your lingo. We just say dummy in our uh, places. Um, so... Yes, effectively, this was, so this was utilized from recording block two of series one, and they also made a second prop, which we call the Grey Aztec, but I've decided not to go in that because you guys might want to go home at some point. Um, and so uh, from there, the wide slider was used up until the end of series two. You may remember it from such scenes as when he uh, blows open the doors and says, doesn't wound, doesn't maim, doesn't kill, but it is very good opening doors uh, and such like. And then it got changed again into this, which we call the tri-slider, and that's because... It's got three screws on the handle there. Uh, it was the third version of this prop, and it was used during Series 3. Again, we got really creative with these names. Um, and so this is the same prop, effectively. Um, the body here uh, was used from the original one. What they did was they filled in the wide slider channel with filler. They turned it around, and that blue strip that's on the slide, that slide, side, they cut into it to make it into the slider channel. They then made a sort of rudimentary blue strip, which is why this one looks a little bit more janky, um, and then added this sort of screw mechanism on the top of it. Uh, and so this was utilized from Runaway Bride onwards until the end of series three. Uh, it was last seen in the scene where the Doctor locks the controls between the end of the universe and where the TARDIS landed last, which is right here, right now, in the terms of Harold Saxon and uh, 2007. And so, this, they also, the only thing they did remake on this was they remade this section here. So they, they got rid of the original one and they made a wider one so that they could have a bigger uh, slider bit going inside of that. But everything else was the same. From there, though, we get onto the Cream Rabato. Now, we've changed the last name because it was a different maker. So uh, with the Cream Rabato, uh, it was all the same parts because uh, effectively the BBC at the time didn't have quite the capability to make these parts. They were a bit more complicated. The sort of um, head section here is actually very difficult to make. So they just took that bit off. So that's the same parts from the Cream Aztec, the Wide Slider and the Tri Slider all reused over and over again. This was for the first uh, time used in Voyage of the Damned and lasted till the end of the show. Uh, and so... They remade the body section here and they added this new slider plate in um, to sort of be a bit more sleeker. And this is a sort of more commonly seen David Tennant design. Um, and then all of this was the same parts originally used. And this is from the tri slider still. So they didn't remake that part. So it's an amalgamation of all of the screwdrivers ever seen and was all the way from the start with Eccleston. And now it's in the other room. So this is the one that was brought here today. Uh, and so you can all see it. And so it was last seen in the 11th hour. So David Tennant got to keep the other prop. As I said, there was two props. And so he got to keep the other one as a personal one. That was when he finished filming The End of Time. But he actually stayed on to film the Sarah Jane Adventures, which was the wedding of Sarah Jane Smith episode. And of course, it was then retained by the BBC to make 11th Hour. So the reason the paint on this is not looking quite as good as it could do is not because of poor upkeep. Uh, it's actually because of the fact that it was put into the goo that Prisoner Zero makes. You know, remember in the episode, it's found on the table by Amy and it's covered in this sort of stuff. And so effectively, the, uh, whatever that goo was melted the paint. Um, 
So you can actually, so the reason it's become this kind of color is you can actually see the gray primer they used underneath showing through the crackle uh, where there should be actual paint. And interestingly, I don't think you can see it in this picture, but when you go outside and have a look, uh, if you look on the side, there's a lot of paint missing. And if you watch the episode, Matt Smith, when he gets the screwdriver back, goes, oh, what's the bad alien done to you? And he rubs the side of it, and he takes off all the paint in his hand at that moment. Um, thanks, Matt. Every sonic screwdriver props you get given, he just decided, you know what? This shouldn't be in one piece. It's like, thank you. Great.